Brian's holding a potato. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> Thank you. It's not a potato. Is that a potato? Isn't that amazing? Mm. I found that the other day when I was out for a walk, and I thought, that is the most potato-like object I've ever seen. Yeah. It's a stone. See that? Oh, wow. That's like... Where were you? Um, Oxfordshire. There we go. Why am I even thinking it will smell like a potato? <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. All right, so this, this is very untidy, but this is the room where I, this is the dark room where I make the light objects. And it's quite embarrassingly untidy. I, I don't know if I should actually show you how these work, really. Go on. Because it's, um, it's a bit, sort of takes the magic away a little bit, doesn't it? Well, if we just let this fall forward, then, then you can look away just and we can go, look, little peek. It's nice. I mean, I used to, before LEDs were around, I used to use television sets at the back here. So I used the TV to project light into the box. Just with one, showing one colour on each screen or something? Well, in fact, I, I would make tapes of fields of colour, which changed. So, uh -huh. so I, had, I had the same effect as this. I had changing light but using um, a very clumsy system, the TV, which prior to um, LEDs existing, that was the best way of doing it. And then, of course, I, I run these from a little computer that's in here, an Arduino. They're only about this big. It's, it's a single circuit board. Do you just, like, come in here on a whim when you, when you fancy, like, noodling, yeah. or do you so just I, knock yourself away for hours? So I usually, if I start in here, I usually spend the day in here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I don't work on them like this. I work on them on their back, obviously, because I'm moving around the pieces of card and so on inside and the mm. lights. So I, I'm looking down at them always. So I, I end up usually with quite a stiff neck. <laughs> yeah. I, made, I made these ones, these simple ones, because I wanted to make things that could be reproduced easily. So I didn't have to make each one individually. Because yeah. I, was, I was trying to think of a way of making these for the NHS that was affordable for them. Mm -hmm. which means that I want to be able to make one and then get it reproduced. So these are reproducible, whereas the, the other ones that I made carefully by hand with lots of curves and so on aren't, <laughs> essentially. And over there you've got, you've got some sort of 3D plan for a... This, this is um, for an installation that I'm going to do in Barcelona in June. So this, this is a sort of plan of the room that I'm going to be doing it in. I think the problem with computers is that you can make everything look great on a computer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and the reality is nearly always disappointing if you, if you work that way around. Yeah. So if you start with this, which looks a bit kind of ham-fisted, yeah. <laughs> if you make it look good there, you know it's going to look good, even better in yeah. the real thing. So they, they play little pieces of music. <laughs> That's distorting a bit because it's turned up a bit too loud. So these are not just bits of speakers, th these are working speakers. They're working speakers, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Here they are. <laughs> <laughs> and so these ones are as well. This is another speaker experiment up here. I do like the speakers though because they, they always sound like they're further away than they really are. So right. they, they give a f if you use them in a room, they give a feeling of distance, of of much bigger space. Is that though these particular speakers or this particular size of speaker? These speakers are the cheapest ones you can find. Right, they're about eighty p each. <laughs> um, but it's just to do with very small speakers and the fact that there are a lot of them, and I think they're. Therefore, the, the phase relationship between yep. them is a bit complicated. Yep. And it gives you the impression that you're hearing something. Even yeah. now, you can get that feeling of it. It sounds like it's, it could be a long way away. Well, let me see if I can get it out and get it working. If you can pick up the end yep. there. I, I don't know whether this is the ways the bridesmaid. still working or whether it's had a... It may have had a bit of an accident. Welcome, yes, okay, thank you. We're feeling welcomed. Oh dear, that's not good. Ah, yeah. there it is. There oh. it is. Oh! 
So, so this is part of a set of things called 77 million paintings. So this essentially never repeats in billions of years. It's constantly generating mm -hmm. new, new images. Do you find as much uh, beauty in that right now then that you would in something that you would take time to create and then lock down, if you see what I mean? Uh, sometimes, yeah. yes. I mean, sometimes it does things that are so bafflingly fantastic, you think, gosh, I, I <laughs> never would have thought of that. Um, it, it produces, it creates things that are beyond my taste, mm -hmm. if, you, if you see what I mean. Right. So this is what I like about it, that my taste is, has a certain boundary to it, a certain, there's a certain edge to my taste, and this thing often works outside of that edge. Would you say that you are a, as much a scientist as you are an artist? Yeah, I, I like, most of these are science books actually. Mm -hmm. so, so in fact, most of what I read probably is, or at least I'd say 65% is science mm. of some kind. And yeah, I like science. I like the fact that it's a public language that anybody can join in with. You know, there's, there's no barrier to entering a scientific conversation. You have to understand what it's about. Yeah. <laughs> but aside from that, there's, there's no mystical side to it of, oh, it's too deep for you to ever understand, <laughs> or, or you're not at the right spiritual level or something like that. So what do you think of artists who, who have that kind of um, opinion that it is, you know, too well, deep for most people, or, or only they can... Well, I think they're poor conversationalists, generally. Right. <laughs> Oh, that looks, that's, that's lovely. That's lovely, isn't it? Mm. I like conversation, you know, and I like, mm. I like argument. I like to see if things can be understood. Now, I think sometimes people are a bit frightened of that because they think that if you understand something, the mystery disappears. Mm. It's, it's suddenly lost all its charm. Well, I don't actually feel that way. I, th I think whenever you think you understand something, what you've done is opened another door to further mysteries. You, you never get to the bottom yeah. of anything. Yeah. Everything gets, sort of opens out like a fractal, you know, it keeps, it keeps um, becoming richer and richer. When I'm actually making something, I'm working from another part of the brain. I'm just thinking, oh, that's great, I'll do more of that. How do I make that even nicer? So that's working in, entirely intuitively, generally. Um, intuitively with quite a lot of experience, but Nonetheless, the judgments are made on a just a basis of um, excitement, really. Mm. Oh, I like this. I want to do more of it. Mm. I want to make more of it. Um, but then afterwards, I look at what I've done and I think, now, why did that... What was actually working there? What made me excited about that? What was I doing that I haven't done before, you know? Mm. Um, and then having isolated that, if I can, and you can't always, then that becomes a starting point for something else. So, so this, this whole thing about making generative work, which is what I call all of this, there's another nice example of one there. Mm. <laughs> Lo on lots of distractions yeah. in this room. <laughs> um, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to make music which is not a, a distinct set of sounds? I've made a lot of music like that. Um, but which is a set of instructions for how sounds could work together and how sounds could be. Um, so I, that's where I really started on this. If I, if I didn't have any other rules, you would just hear the same things happening over and over again against one another. But in fact, in this, in this case, I've got three rules. One is that 14% of these notes, a random 14%, are going to be pitched down by three semitones. The second is that 41% of them are going to go an octave down, 12 mm -hmm. semitones. So can I just say, scientist. <laughs> I'd go further, quantum scientist. <laughs> because it's all about probabilities here. Yeah. yeah, it's probabilities. And then this, this is a corrector, so that if, if any notes are produced that I don't want there, I mm -hmm. can correct with this. And in fact, so if it ever produces a B, which I don't want in the piece, it will turn it to an A. I'm, I'm not a musician, but can I ask why you don't want a B 
in the piece. Okay, is it clash with the key or something? Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. So these pieces 